so many games exist. Most will never get any media coverage, and most don't deserve any. But this series isn't about most. It's about the few. The indie games that have something going for them, but maybe aren't SEO friendly. The indies whose obscurity will ensure that flanking their title with the word review won't do them any favors because nobody knows to look them up. The indies that would benefit from being bundled into a review compilation after being sampled for a handful of hours. The indies that have all found their way into my inbox. By publisher mailing list or earnest solo dev please, these are the inbox indies fighting for ground in the attention economy, and probably not winning if they're being featured here. I can't promise they'll all be great, but I can promise they'll all have some interesting elements that compelled me to write and feature them. If my channel's mission statement of scripted reviews for games of all sizes is to ever be a true philosophy more than just a North Star to shoot for, then the smallest end of that size spectrum needs more attention. And sometimes it needs a microscope. Petite 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 is Vampire Survivors meets Osmosis Jones, where the perpetual influx of baddies a survivor's game needs is skinned up as the battles going on in our bodies at all times. Cells, bacteria, and pathogens are the tokens being moved around on screen, all with a beautiful hand-drawn aesthetic. It's got the usual stick of getting a handful of synergistic auto-firing actives and modifying passives, but keeping your host safe will demand grappling with a few mechanics you won't find in any of Petite Petite Petite's peers. Mechanics like all these external health bars you gotta defend. A lot of your power-ups are gated behind how well you play emergency services to organs under assault, because they're being overwhelmed by enemies as much as you are. Saving them from these harmful pathogens is harder than you might expect due to a subtle control quirk. There is no distinction between where you move and where you aim, so your natural desire to kite around the horde while firing back into them is in contention with how firing actually works. Instead, your movement must be delicately timed with circular motions that have you turning around to shoot inward, then resuming your path away. At first, it's a little clunky, and its significance is exacerbated by the fact that this is one of the few bullet heavens where there's no on-screen indicator that tells you when your next bullet is firing. You have to get into this rhythmic pattern of movement and offense, which is ironic because this game's rhythm may also drive you insane. This game has like 30 seconds of OST on loop for your entire run, and the predisposition I have towards being critical of that fact is being overtaken by its chorus worming its way through my skull, because any analysis of Petit 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 would be incomplete without appreciation for its vibe. It wears its country of origin proudly on its sleeve, and that's arguably its best element. It's got the same irreverent tone as the best Japanese exports of the early aughts. I love how our primary defense cell personification is this little ooze with a goofy walk cycle. I love how he dances in the load screen, and I love his defined sculpted butt cheeks. There are survivors games out there with more interesting build options and enjoyable combat, but few that nail such an unconventional style, and none who will be as stuck in your head for hours after you put it down. I don't think Plague Breaker has quite the same mental staying power, but its conventional presentation is masking solid execution on classic gaming fundamentals. This platforming roguelike has the handprint of multiple Castlevania eras on it. It's got the inventory management, RPG-like systems, and on-hit enemy nameplates of your Symphony of the Nights, but its aesthetic and game feel go back a few generations before that. Even without bottomless pits, it manifests NES Castlevania through its combat. You have your traditional roguelike concerns like health and upgrades, but the 2D perspective will have you worried about more retro concerns too, like which enemies drop from ledges and which will stand there and try to pepper you from safety. Most attacks from both you and your opponents are slow and deliberate. You don't get any mobility spells unless you spec into them, so your average fight in Plague Breaker demands skirting around your opponent's max range and jumping in to get some swipes, something you'll need to be extra careful about because just making contact with their bodies deals damage too. Between combat, you'll want to scour each floor of the castle you're ascending in hopes of finding rare items and equipment, as well as the currency that lets you buy them. Your default moveset is sparse, just moving and jumping. Everything else your character does is a weapon, spell, or consumable you map to four active slots, making the actual ways in which you deal damage radically different run to run. And that's a distinction that means a whole lot when you get into some of Plague Breaker's meta run systems. Successful completion of the tower not only rewards you with your expected roguelite rewards of more classes to do it again, but also a custom class creator to begin any future run with. Get a starting power budget to spend as you see fit between a list of abilities, items, and passives, with the extension of that list occurring when you uncover them in future runs. The same sorts of run-defining combos you need to luck your way into in other roguelikes, you can just start with here, which does take away some of the impromptu random rogue excitement, but replaces it with calculated tactics. Its custom class emphasis gives a different kind of thrill than both its visual inspirations and its roguelike contemporaries, but it's a worthwhile incentive to keep collecting more stuff and finding more ridiculous combos. 
making Plague Breaker old school fun that's just as enjoyable to break as it is to play. I don't think Monster Racing League could be considered old school in any way. Sure, screenshots may look like a cartoony micro machines, but the technology that inspired its creation and the genres that inspired its driving mechanics couldn't be any more different. Because Monster Racing League was originally going to be a play to earn NFT game before dropping all those aspects and landing on Steam free to play. So color me surprised to find out that divorced from its Web3 influences, it's still got unique mechanics and a clear identity, if not endless variety. Because Monster Racing League is an auto battler, or auto racer I guess. You can technically move from left to right, but those movements are always bound within the track. Keep your hands off the keyboard and your ape or whatever will still make perfect turns every time. So the skill isn't about driving, but decision making. You've got access to three customizable cooldown based powers you can use in the race, and timing them is what separates the wheat from the chaff. Save your shields for areas of high density like your blitz from the starting line or convergences of shortcuts. It actually works, and overtaking whoever is in first place with a well-timed missile and nitrous boost around the corner is more exciting than the passivity of its gameplay style would imply. There is a clear limit on how much fun you can get out of it though. Monster Racing League's Achilles wheel is that it's a multiplayer game without multiplayers. The inclusion of bots does sustain the core racing regardless of how few people are online at any given time, but without a meaningful way to tie these races together into a Grand Prix or a campaign, a few laps around each track is enough to kind of get the point. But despite not being your next long term racer, it's still a thoughtful exploration of auto battlers without battles, and that's an idea I can't wait to see more developers play with. All media is a product of its inspirations. Hell, this very series wouldn't exist without Super Bunny Hop's games from my inbox, and the Black Grimoire Cursebreaker wouldn't exist without RuneScape. It's among the latest in a trend I'm a huge fan of indie D makes that unlive service MMOs and crystallize their essence into single transactions, single player video games. And the brilliance of trying to do a lo-fi runescape is how tenable that goal is. If not emulating its vast decades of content, then certainly emulating its aesthetic combat and progression systems. And emulate it does. The Black Grimoire Cursebreaker is both an accurate surface level facsimile of runescape, but also a game that understands runescape's beating heart. And you can tell based on how much it worships skills. You don't level up, your skills do, and entire segments of the UI are dedicated to showing you the fruits of your skill gaining labor even mid combat. And it works, there's an immediacy to Curse Breaker, it gets you enveloped into that skill grind fast, and unlike other RPGs that ask you to make choices on your proficiencies, Curse Breaker wants you to be both a jack and a master of all trades. Early quest lines have your usual monster slaying and retrieval missions, but also emphasize the looming necessity of gathering and crafting. There are mainline objectives to level your mining skill to clear boulder impediments, and brew potions to save ailing NPCs. The combat is stat oriented by design. Click on an enemy and you'll start swinging at each other, with dice rolls governing hits, misses, and crits. The biggest influence you exert over combat will be what weapons to use and what abilities to perform with a level of intentional indirectness. Clicking on an ability won't use it, but cue its use in alignment with your character's speed. It's passive by design and a statement of intent. You're not here to impose your skill onto this system, but to grind your way through it and power up your character. It's honest about what it is, and what it is is a whole lot less grimy without the incentives that come with live service MMOs. It's a grind not to increase player retention, but instead a grind just because it wants to be. Sure, Cursebreaker may just be a modest indie runescape, but divorced from the philosophies and incentives that drive MMO construction, that ended up being way more appealing than I was anticipating. Cook Sir Forever is probably the most well known of our inbox indies by simple virtue of the fact that it's part of a franchise, but you'd be forgiven if you hadn't heard of this entry specifically. A simple comparison of both review quantity and quality suggests that Forever might ironically have less staying power than any of its predecessors, something that can be attributed both to its choice to pursue an early access release and a massive shift in direction. Cook Sir Forever is many things, but it's definitely not safe. Maybe an honest recognition that this formula wouldn't work forever, Cook Serve Forever has a slight de-emphasis on the cooking and serving, and a doubling down on narrative. You play as I forget her name as she works her way up the cooking landscape, from her dilapidated apartment and small back alley restaurants, to more fine dining establishments. At least if this main menu screen is anything to judge by. I didn't get that far because of cooking mechanics that are slightly undercooked since last time. 
Previous entries were these left brain, right brain multitasking challenges, where taking multiple orders simultaneously had you looking out for audio cues in between serving up the same few dishes with the same inputs. Cook Serve Forever has less plates to spin, but higher complexity for the ones you are spinning. One dish is in front of you at any given time, which you prepare by pressing input sequences, which unlike pre-forever titles will contain some curveball inputs, like repeating previous presses or holds. But it became quickly apparent that this isn't enough to sustain a game. I have to imagine that the idea was that the cooking and serving would be keeping your hands busy in between the more serious and dramatic story here, but that kind of ignores that the original did have a story, albeit one that was told through gameplay and not despite it. Having to deal with more orders than you have hands, long hours at the restaurant, frantically scrubbing dishes and toilets in between orders, there may not have been any named characters, but there was no question that Cook Serve Delicious told a rags to riches story with literal elbow grease. It was a game of simple cathartic thrills, with beeping microwaves and impatient customers, but forever is little more than an abstraction of a cooking game in service to a narrative main course, and even then it fails to properly integrate that narrative. After a long, dramatic cutscene of our hero accepting the call to adventure and moving to a new city to start a new life, the next set of gameplay options prompted me to cook in the exact same dingy alleyways I just escaped. For all the improvements it makes in its style and visuals, the sleek presentation on all the dishes, and all the writing and voice acting, this course fails to realize that sometimes less is more. But sometimes less is less, because dammit I wish Heroish had more heroes. Choose from one of six playable characters and rally your troops to take down your enemy's stronghold. Hero Ish is a transplant from the Apple Arcade, an origin betrayed by big chunky menu buttons, automated hero attacks, and troop-like minions that demand no micromanagement. But any hesitation about its mobile genesis you may have would be doing a disservice to the fun gameplay it does offer. Its influences span decade, platform, and genre. Tower defense, card game, and MOBA are all here in equal measure, but the pieces are rearranged differently than you might expect, and the end result is this halfway point somewhere between Clash Royale and League of Legends. In either a campaign or online play, you have direct control over a hero who will auto-swing wherever you leave him. The strategy comes through usage of skills doled out via a card game hand, and how you organize a push of simple minions down a single lane. The result is an elaborate tug of war, where ground isn't gained solely by killing enemies but having the right resources and troops in place when you do. But the genius is not from its elements but from their blend, and how it's managed the perfect mix of hands-off mobile appropriate strategy and more intimate hands-on action you're in direct control of. Regardless of how simple it is, you can absolutely make big plays here, like baiting your opponent to your tower only to unload your accumulated mana on crowd control and have them die within your territory. The six heroes that do exist, as much as I wish there were more, do control and behave radically differently, and despite an actual player count that disagrees with the game's multiplayer focus, I was able to find a few rounds thanks to crossplay. Even with a dwindling player base, there is a campaign that organizes bot matches into an escalation of challenge and a meta progression layer of card acquisition, all of which done with a level of production far higher than its double digit Steam review count would imply. It's a shame that its performance didn't warrant the further investment its core rules could so easily support. And while I think in its current state it's worth the $10 it asks of you, it could have been great, instead of just being great-ish. Greed Venturi is a hilarious compound word of a title, but I don't know if it fully conveys exactly what this experience is. Yes, it's a game about inventories and gear accumulation, but that's only half the story. Greed Venturi's closest cousins aren't loot-based ARPGs, but mouse-only browser classics like The Black Knight. Before Grieventory is a game about loot, it's a game about clicking. Almost exclusively clicking, actually. And not the point and click adventuring kind, but the real time combat kind. In Grieventory, you click to deal damage, you click to prevent damage, you click to interact with projectiles, and your special moves are just modifications to your clicks. You start as a comically under-equipped hero so that you can greed your way into more armor and more gold, which is also your primary leveling currency. Move left and right throughout the map in a linear adventure, pick up quests, and of course get into click combat. And there is surprising depth to this idea thanks to some great encounter design. Its clicks really started to click for me once more involved fight mechanics presented themselves. Enemies would fling damaging bombs at me which could be reflected with a click and drag. There was also an enemy mob that would heal himself, but rather than doing so with an unstoppable infusion of HP, he would throw a healing potion into the air that could be deflected away from him or even knocked back towards me. That's when the game is at its best mid-combat, with your eyes darting around the screen and your mouse not far behind. Ensuring that not a single clickable is getting past you while also maintaining your click-based damage per second on the baddies themselves. 
Ironically, it's the Greed Venturing where Greed Venturi sometimes distracts itself. Stat-based level ups barely matter compared to the strength of equipment but that equipment is subject to a contrived RNG-based upgrading and repairing system that adds nothing to the core fun. It also leads to an impermanent feeling for that new piece you just got in a way that adds frustration more than it does tension. But Grieventory has got it where it counts, and gets way more out of its core clicking premise than I would have ever expected. But would it be a better game with trains? Most games are, and the developer of Choo Choo Survivors is testing that hypothesis with a train-based survivors game. In Choo Choo Survivors, there's not a duration to be survived, but a distance to be traveled. Your train moves along a single eastward rail and, as expected, you can only influence its speed on its direction. Where the movement-based kiting strategies would exist is instead the tension between speed and upgrades, for the simple reason that currency is physical in the world and won't absorb into your train if you speed past it too fast. And the end result is a game where optimal play looks like this, a train awkwardly stuttering down the rails instead of gliding over them. It's an inconsistency that's partially remedied via meta progression which allows you to increase the speed at which currency is magnetized to you. But it's in such stark opposition to what the fantasy of actually conducting a train is that it begs the question why you would ever design your train game around constantly needing to stop. When you are going max speed you can run over zombies, but ramming is a secondary source of zombie death behind the guns you strap to your train. Upgrading their fire rate, damage output, and knockback is your source of mid-run progression, and unlike many of its peers, it's completely unrandomized. You can just linearly go down your list of guns and beef them up one at a time. That's exactly what I did for each of my runs, and it was a strategy that went unpunished. Without any random traits to warp a build around, once you've identified a working combo, you can just repeat it until you proceed to the next level. But what it lacks in spontaneous fun, it compensates for with microscopic detail. The firing of your guns may be automated, but their target priority need not be, due to your ability to change firing behavior on a per gun basis, with the option for pure manual cursor targeting if you want it. It makes your average bout with Choo Choo Survivors a puzzle to be solved, though it does fall victim to the fact that once you've seen a solution, you can't exactly unsee it. So do trains make every game better? Maybe not yet. Its early access release means that potentially future updates will get us there. But my fear is that no matter how many maps or trains Choo Choo Survivors adds, it's got lack of replay value built into its core static upgrading rules. Which is a shame. I think it's kind of cool. I just wish its build paths weren't so on rails. But if you're looking for gaming certainties, I've got a different one. Every game is better with a positive gun to hand ratio. Vampire Hunters takes dual wielding to a cartoonish extreme. It combines a survivor's like perpetual influx of baddies to fight with my favorite kind of gun fetishism, the mother gunship kind, where giant guns take up so much of the screen that you need a gun size slider in the options menu if you want to see anything. And you're going to need all those guns, because Vampire Hunters is not only vampire survivors from the first person, but it also flanks you with a moving wall that forces you forward into all the vampires you're hunting. So while you technically have full WASD range of motion, in practice you're playing something more akin to a rail shooter. It's a decision that pays off in spades by forcing you to go headfirst into danger, and of course ensuring you're well equipped enough for that not to be a death sentence. You'll want to start each run by going wide and getting your hands filled. All of your guns fire off with a single click of your mouse, but they won't reload until you've released and pressed again. It adds this core rhythmic element where you want to find the sweet spot of unloading as much of your clips as you can while juggling the varying reload speeds of each gun. That reload tension isn't coming from ammo conservation. You've got unlimited. The biggest fear is the pockets of time where all your guns are reloading simultaneously, both because you'll leave yourself open to attack, but also because you'll lose out on retaining your combo meter. So the name of the game is Gun Redundancy and Quick Kills, and tension gets added further via a sprint button that's not only a quicker way to get to the end of the hallway, but also a lever to pull that spawns in more baddies. At first sight, a downside to pay for increased speed, but in the hands of a skilled player it's a way to ensure spawn rate meets the needs of your combo meter. I'm a sucker for games that have obvious visual displays of your power increasing and comically loading the screen with guns is just the best way to do that. The steampunk setting adds to the silliness because all these guns are just daisy chained together with these inelegant handles. All the reload counters are like clinky old timey cash registers. It's great, I love it, and that's why I was shocked to navigate to its store page to find only 4 user reviews on Steam. I've already dumped 6 hours into it and will surely put another 6 in this weekend. Which is why it's all the more disappointing that I would have never even heard of this one if it didn't find its way into my inbox. 